In a world where high-performance zero-defect buildings are hard to find, two men are on a mission to disrupt the status quo. Welcome to the Enifis Complex, the property design and development podcast. Let your hosts Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean keep you up with who is innovating and doing great work perspective on the adjacent possible and challenges to the status quo welcome to the edifice complex i'm robert bean your co-host and unofficial mediator here again with my colleague official agitator friend and yoda of most everything to do with buildings mr adam muggleton say hello yoda Hello, Yoda. Feelings about the built environment. I have, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's our pleasure today to have on the show one of the world's leading researchers in indoor environmental studies. He has been a principal investigator for a large number of state, federal, and industry grants addressing building energy performance, indoor environmental quality criteria, field monitoring procedures, and architectural aerodynamics, which we're going to talk a lot about in today's interview. Projects include developing wireless sensor systems for building control and electricity demand responsiveness, developing and testing new personal environmental control systems, which we're also going to try to get in today, human comfort testing and modeling, web-based surveying of occupant satisfaction buildings, determining energy efficiency potential of thermally diversified environments, and a whole slew of other things. He's active in technical standards committees on ASHRAE, which is how I know Ed from ASHRAE SSPC 55, Thermal Environmental Conditions for Human Occupancy and is a co-founder of the Society of Building Science Educators. And Ed, I think you've advised over 85 or 90 graduate students in the research track and have had 18 PhD students, so welcome to the show. (laughs) Well, thank you, Robert. Ed, you're a professor emeritus of architecture at UC Berkeley and director of the Center for Environmental Study Research, which is the university's research unit for building science and resource-efficient urban designs, and also director of the Center for the Built Environment. You received your PhD in architectural sciences in 1972, so you're still a young man from the University of Edinburgh, UK, and you hold a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture History and Master's Degree in Forestry and Urban Studies from Yale University. And you also started the UC Building Science Laboratory in 1980 after heading the architectural research section at the National Bureau of Standards. How did you get to do all that, and what are you going to do for the second half of your life? <laughs> ah, well, it, it certainly takes time. You've got to be old <laughs> to, to end up with a list like that. But this going way back, I was going to be an architect, and I was doing that and working in architecture firms as a high school student in the summers. I, I was completely convinced about it, and there I was in architecture school in the early 60s, and I got frustrated by the, the nature of the discussions of what went on, the, the, the crits, the reviews, that the content of what was being discussed didn't seem to have or didn't seem to depend an awful lot on factual material. Uh, <laughs> it, there were, it, it, wasn't, it was before the age of the highly theoretical architecture, which has been a more recent phenomenon. But nonetheless, there wasn't this interest in uh, how things actually worked. And I've got to say, even at that time, energy and environment, and, uh, comfort and things like that, were of some interest to me, but to very few others. And the thing that influenced me the most, I'm going to put a pitch in here for a, a book by uh, Victor Algie, who was a mm. an Hungarian professor, but who moved to Brazil for a while, and then he was at Princeton University, and he wrote a book called Design with Climate, and that was published in 1963, and I got it and read it, and I was just blown away by how wonderful it was. It, it was written for the conditions which existed at that time, that the residential air conditioning had not come into practice yet. It was just starting, but it summed up all the information that architects had prior to that time when they had to learn how to make buildings comfortable without the assistance of air conditioning. Well, imagine that. Yeah. What a what a what a what a I crazy can't. concept, eh? Right. <laughs> well, this guy was great. You know, he summarized all the solar control things and the natural ventilation, the aerodynamics, and he produced beautiful graphics for this, which in my mind were beautiful. And anyway, it made me frustrated, and I 
happened by chance to run into a professor of micrometeorology at Yale in the forestry school. And I got this notion that maybe buildings should be, you know, climatically designed based on some kind of principles. <laughs> like that. This is heresy. This is heresy. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, so I, I kind of went to a set of professors who were both in the, in, the, in the architecture school and in the forestry school. And I, I learned that in Edinburgh and in, in various parts of Britain, there were professors with similar confluences of interest. And so I had a chance to go to the University of Edinburgh. That's where I did my doctorate eventually on what was first called building science, and then they called it architectural science as they tried to move it more toward the architecture side of things. And anyway, that was what I did. It was energy and human habitability, comfort in buildings. And this was in 1970 or so. It wasn't really till 1975 that, that there was the energy crisis, the oil embargo, that all of a sudden there was this tremendous interest in how could you save energy uh, in buildings. And the government in the U.S., I was back in the U.S. by then, started programs to develop computer models for simulating buildings um, on an hour-by-hour basis, things like that. And that's how I ended up getting to the Bureau of Standards to it come participate in that type of effort. And out of that, eventually, there was an opening at Berkeley, where I had been before. I had been in the vicinity of Berkeley for a few years after my graduate degree, and I'd met people there. And so ultimately, I was had the chance to start up at Berkeley, where we developed a building science subdiscipline within the architecture program. Well. Cool. You know, Ed, you said something about architecture and science. I've been doing some work lately with uh, QEEG, which is uh, basically brain mapping. And I think when we enroll architectural students, we should actually put the brain cap on them, monitor their brain signature, and then use those two words together, architecture and science, and see what happens to the brain signature. (laughs) If if there's a whole whole bunch of distortion, you know, then we probably shouldn't allow them in. The, the, the science part of architecture, where did it go? What happened to it? I mean, you go back into the days of Vitruvius, right? And even before then, you know, the, the science was a big part of architecture. Leonardo da Vinci, and, you know, where did it go? What happened? Well, when I was studying in the, in the beginning, there was a fair bit of focus on science, but it was all structurally oriented. The big challenges were kind of structural design and the engineers were figuring it out pretty quickly, but the architects still had control when I was in school of thin shells, concrete shells, you know, where they could kind of sculpt things in models and, and physical models and put them up and, and intention structures. So there was a great deal of fascinating patient in this, in these topics of thin shell designs and tensile designs and there were architects and engineers around the world whose buildings were really dramatic, which were taking advantage of this. But ultimately, the engineers caught up with that and had models for predicting those as well. And it kind of, the gas went out of the structural research in architecture. It's just about the time that the energy problem and the environmental problems became more important. And so it's true that the you know, what research goes on in architecture now tends to be more on the energy environment side. But it's not in mainstream architecture schools. It isn't the main thing that goes on in architecture schools. It's a bit of a sideline. That's just yeah. the nature of how they teach design. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Because you think back, the architects were always what I would call technologists and artists, right? Mm-hmm. And it seems today they're more artists than technologists. Is that would you agree with that? Well, that, you know, you have to differentiate between school and practice. Yeah, you know, there are plenty of practices. Also, the in the old days, I mean, when I was talking about structural, that's visible, and architects are trained to to look at the visual yes. side. Of it. So anything you build structurally is you can draw. But the things we're talking about in, in energy and comfort and things like that are invisible and <laughs> are difficult to get any kind of feedback on, you know, and they're hard for design professors to teach. Uh, yeah. 
So basically, you need to then start pushing the student into some kind of engineering. Now, there must be some way to teach engineering that isn't entirely first principles math based, you know, the engineering curricula, because the architects aren't going to have time for that, even if they had the inclination. So there has to be ways to do that more graphically. And that's certainly what we tried to do in our teaching um, of undergraduates and graduates here. With computer tools, that becomes more and more possible because you can almost easily, you know, do massive, massive calculation and produce things that are graphic that show the motion of air, the, the transfer of heat, yeah. the rising of buoyant plumes, you know, things like that. So, so, so I'm, I'm kind of optimistic that in the future we'll have better design, we'll have enough design tools that we should be able to interest and teach architects to be a little more intuitive about what actually physically happens. Yeah, it's an yeah. uh, embedded technology issue, right? So it's like your calculator. The embedded technology in a calculator is a printed circuit board. So we don't even give it a second thought because it just works, right? And mm-hmm. in a building, I, my theory is the embedded technology is the building services, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems, right? And the only time you care about them is when they don't work, which is frequently, unfortunately. And from a design point of view, if you're an architect, it's hard to think about them because they are so embedded. As you say, form and structure are sort of related and visible, whereas the embedded technology, not so much, unless it becomes an architectural feature of our Norman Foster. But what you're, you're saying is I think architects need to come back to being more practitioner, technology based you know, using applied engineering principles rather than first principles. And, you know, it needs uh, maybe an institution like Berkeley, someone, some institution that's prominent to try and move that needle back that way. Do you think that's a possibility in the future? Oh, I, I certainly hope so. I can recall the professor saying, well, you know, for these services that you're talking about, just make sure you leave a room, you know, give us enough room between the floor and the ceiling, give us enough room and cabinets and things like that. But... The other side to that would be if you could integrate it into the building somehow or if you can get rid of a lot of the stuff that you're having to make room for because you are doing the building more efficiently in some manner, then that would actually be a a far more aesthetic solution that you could look at and feel more of your building could be architecture and less of it, so much of products that are hidden away in closets. Yeah. You know, uh, a while ago I I went and watched the uh, movie about Ray Charles. And there's a scene in there where Ray Charles goes to buy a house. And I'm thinking to myself, how does somebody who's visually impaired purchase a property that they can't see? And from that, I ended up writing an article called, In a Town Called Comfort, Only the Blind Can See. Oh, I like that. <laughs> right? In a town called Comfort, Only the Blind Can See. And so from that, when we're now dealing with clients, we get them to sit in their spaces and close their eyes which becomes visual pollution to the other senses. So now they have to engage their sense of smell, their hearing, what they feel. And then from that, we get them to make an inventory of all the things that they don't like or don't want in their next project. And then we say, okay, now go hire an architect. (laughs) Right? I like that. That's powerful. Yeah. And so it becomes a design principle of designing from the inside out, starting with the occupant and and their sensory needs, Without the visual, vision is important. We're not saying that's not important at all because there's lots of studies, you know, where, where the visual stimulation can actually help the human body. But in terms of the built environment, what's on the inside, we have to block out the vision first, I think, in order to design good spaces. Yeah, we have to develop intuition on um, um, kind of the feel of things that you don't that you don't just see that aren't obvious from from looking at pictures or actual buildings. I've always felt that uh, sailing is something that people should, all architects should all try to learn at some point because to do it right, especially to maybe compete or to try to compete in it, you have to know an awful lot about invisible stuff. You, you have to be able to see the wind. You have to learn to feel it on your neck so that you can adjust to changes in wind and things like that. It just makes you more, and if you kind of really try hard to do it well, you may end up using smoke sticks or flares or things so that you can watch the wind. And, you know, architects can do that too. There are little ways to visualize the flow of things, uh, which is otherwise invisible. 
And just to develop the sense of, you know, does this work? Does it not work? Is it important? Not important? And so forth. And I, I mention that because the way we do buildings now seems to me very much a based on psychrometric chart. It's the, the carrier's chart that shows the relationship between the amount of moisture in the air and the temperature of the air. And the HVAC engineer will produce a machine that can produce, you know, some air supply with a given ratio of, of, of temperature and, and humidity in it. And that's been the whole focus on environmental control. But in fact, they've got two other parameters in there that are influencing people's comfort. One of them is radiation, uh, kind of like uh, could be solar radiation or it could be fireplace type of long wave radiation. And you can use radiation in various good ways to affect how buildings are done more efficiently than by producing this psychrometric air and pumping it in long ducts to wherever the people are. And the other side of it is, is air motion. The air motion that you detect in sailing, when it blows over your skin, it cools you. So if you're in a, anywhere in the warm part of the world, you actually want to have air motion over you pretty much all the time. Or you've got to have colder air, so you have a choice. But moving air is a is 100 times easier and cheaper. It's not easier necessarily, but it's, it's certainly cheaper than cooling and dehumidifying air. So our my recent career has really focused a lot on, on bringing air movement back into consideration in architecture and in engineering, especially in engineering, so that people realize it's a powerful tool that you can integrate into designs and end up with more comfortable buildings that are actually better air quality and have a lot of nice features that has been ignored since the first big push for air conditioning, which happened in the 40s and for commercial buildings, and then in the 60s for residential buildings. That's interesting. So I, I always like to draw the distinction between comfort cooling and full air conditioning. So for me, full air conditioning is control of temperature and humidity, whereas comfort cooling is a function of, yes, a temperature, a delta between inside and outside, but more of a an air movement thing, right? So I'm a big fan of radiant heating and cooling. However, if you went to, as you say, more of a comfort scenario where I have maybe a five-degree delta, let's say I'm in, I don't know, Let's say I'm in California and it's 35 degrees outside. I can be perfectly comfortable at 20. I'm centigrade, by the way. Sorry, guys. Um, yep. I'm originally from England, right? So 35 degrees centigrade outside. <laughs> and I could be perfectly comfortable inside at 28 degrees C with a small breeze. So if I had more than, say, one meter per second air velocity through my space, I would be perfectly comfortable with that because I, I would get a thermal shock going in and out of my building. I would sense, I would have a sensory experience of air movement, which would have a cooling effect, right? So mm -hmm. that is what I would call comfort cooling, which is perfectly acceptable in a residential situation, even an office situation in a way. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, and, and, and interestingly, you know, in that warmer temperature inside, you don't have to dehumidify it as much to have a certain relative yeah. humidity. Yeah. So you, not, you haven't had to cool so much and you haven't had to dehumidify quite so much. And you could probably, if you don't it efficiently, you could probably separate out your, your outside air treatment from trying to blow, you know, to condition everybody in the building by blowing uh, this cold air on them. Or yeah. In the ducts. yeah, so if you're, not, if you're not doing full AC, which is dealing with the latent, essentially, the energy savings could be substantial, right? Because latent's that energy-intensive business. Oh, we, we find these incredible savings that you can introduce. There's a building in Phoenix, admittedly, that, that has an air conditioning system, but the set point is 80 to 28 Celsius. And prior to that, when it was above, say, 7, uh, say, 20, 22, they, they're running ceiling fans. Right. So it's, a, it's an engineering office. It's, it's, it's white-collar work, and they're a good engineering firm. And we were surprised because we surveyed their building and found they had a 92% comfort rate in this building, which is twice as good, twice, it's 80% um, is the maximum that you get in air-conditioned buildings. Otherwise, in, in, in an air-conditioned building, you will always have 10% of the people who are too hot or too cold at the same time because people are different. Yeah. In this building, we had a much better performance. 
And, and here it is, it has a set point of 82 degrees, but prior to that, the fans are running. The interesting thing is that after they turn on the AC, they keep the fans running at the same speed that they were on prior to the air conditioning. The whole time that you're air conditioning, you should have fans running. Yeah. You should not have an air conditioned building with still air or with the diffusers are very carefully designed to make sure the person doesn't feel any air motion. You know, the ADPI index is based on that. Yes. But, but there should be plenty of air motion and the temperature shouldn't be so cold unless it's wintertime. You know, then you should cut the air motion, <laughs> but you don't have to provide right. cooling in the wintertime. So we have produced a problem for ourselves. So how do you cool people by blowing a lot of cold air and without having them feel the cold air and it has to be really cold where you could have actually not cooled the place so much, not dehumidified so much, just put a ceiling fan in, which now you can run a ceiling fan at uh, between 6 watts and 16 watts. That'll cool a whole room. These DC fans are amazingly efficient. Yes. Uh, so yeah. We realize that we are kind of missing the boat. We're, we're spending 500 or 800 watts per person to cool people with something you can do with you know, 10 watts or 15 watts with fan. And that's a good way to segue into some of the research work. The Center for the Built Environment has, if, and you can correct me on these numbers, but over a 10-year period, you've done something like 365 surveys on buildings all over the country. I think over 56,000 people have participated in those surveys. And the collective result is, is that we're getting a great big failure uh, and, and indoor, indoor environmental satisfaction over, the, over those building surveys. Can you maybe talk about those surveys that you've done, the results that you're getting, and maybe just sort of your own observations about why this is happening and what we can do to solve it? Yeah, yeah this survey was one of the first web-based surveys, and we did it in the, but before the year 2000, we started it. And it is a survey that asks people about their, their satisfaction with the building. It's, it's the, um, the space they have available, the light, the acoustics, and the thermal. There's the cleanliness. You know, it's, it's various things that a building owner or operator might want to know how well the, the building's being maintained or being run. And we've actually surveyed well over a thousand buildings now since, since the onset of this. And it's just hundreds of thousands of people have been surveyed. And various statistically oriented folks have, have analyzed their results. And indeed, you know, it's pretty hard to find, if you ask people overall satisfaction, it's very hard to find people even 80% satisfied in about the thermal conditions in the building. Uh, I should actually back up. I should say that of all the items in the building, all the different categories of acoustics and uh, lighting and stuff like that, people are generally very satisfied. There's a, high, there's a positive rating of these buildings. And the overall building always gets a high, more high rating than the ratings for the individual components, the, the things like the space, the working environment, the, the cleanliness, the light level, the sound level from machinery. The building itself even gets a, a better rating. Perhaps people don't expect much from buildings. So they, they think, oh, my building's okay because at least it's not really negative. <laughs> but at the bottom of this list, there are two items that are never satisfying. And those are thermal comfort and speech privacy. So, so mm. speech privacy is, a, is one of the components of acoustics. The noise level is not a problem to most buildings, most people. But the, the privacy is a problem that comes from open plan offices that we have oh. and the overseeing of people from others. Now, I'm assured by all our industry partners that open plan offices are not going away. They are going to remain. There's absolutely no way everybody's going to go back into private offices if they ever had them. You know, So we have to deal with those two problems. Those are the ones that we focus on the most because well, those are... You've hit us. You've hit really. us. Horrible. Um, it depends how you ask the questions, but even if you take their answers that they're slightly dissatisfied and say, okay, that means they're satisfied, we will ignore the slightly part and only count the, the people who are very satisfied as finding the building comfortable. You only find that like 40% of the people are, or 50% of the people who consider the building satisfactory from a thermal perspective. And this is for your, 
your typical engineered building. We've repeated this many, many times and with many other kinds of surveys too. And it's the fact is, is people are not comfortable or not rating their buildings as being comfortable. And this is because people differ and also people people's metabolic rate changes through the day. They come in and they're too hot because they've been walking and they sit down for a while and then they get cold and then they're too hot. And if they're trying to call in complaints to their building operator well, during the course of the day, it's it's not going to work very well because the guy will go crazy. We can't. So, so the buildings aren't dealing very well with this when they're trying to provide a uniform temperature. Uh, the building operators respond by trying to prove that they're doing a good job, that they're keeping the temperature within plus or minus one degree or something like that. And you still have all these dissatisfied people. Keeping the temperature between plus or minus degree takes a huge amount of energy, gigantic amount of energy. So it's a, it's a, it's a failed concept, uh, which we have written about uh, a fair bit. At this point, Adam and Ed, I'd, I'd just like to summarize our conversation that in the world of buildings, we have frustrated architects, frustrated engineers, frustrated facility managers, and frustrated occupants. Is that, a, is that a pretty much summarize what we've talked about so far? I think you crushed it with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, don't, I don't think the students should go be sent away with that horrible um, assessment. <laughs> no. It's probably true, but see, architects and engineers, unless they're called back and sued for, their, for what they did, they move on to the next building, and they, they really are not paying attention to what's happened in the, the building that they that they've built. So they aren't necessarily that frustrated. They're just moving ahead. Uh, Serial to, offenders. Uh, There's just repeat yeah, offending. Right. Right? <laughs> the Edifice Complex will continue in just a moment. If you're enjoying this podcast, we need your help. We're not asking for money, just a minute of your time. Our goal is to make the Edifice Complex podcast as relevant, educational, and useful as possible. By having good ratings, we can reach the widest audience. Therefore, our request is two small things. If you haven't already, leave us a review and rating on iTunes. And subscribe to the Edifice Complex on YouTube, even if you normally only listen to the audio version. These two things will help us immensely. Also, if you would like Robert or Adam to speak, teach, or consult on your project or business, please email admin at edificecomplexpodcast.com. Thanks for your time. And now, back to the show. I've got to say something here about the open plan office before we carry on. So I've got some theories. I used to run an m and design office. I've run a, a several white collar offices. So whenever you walk through, if you're an interior designer or an architect or client, if you walk through any office and you see a white collar person with their headphones on, give that person an office because you are doing them a great disservice by not giving them an office because they want and need privacy to work. They, they're they putting them headphones on because they can't concentrate or their life at work sucks so badly they're listening to a podcast to dial it out, right? <laughs> we need a mixture, in my opinion, of open plan and privacy offices. I don't know if this is some big Bilderberg group thing where they're trying to get everyone to work from home so they make the open plan space so goddamn horrible. But if you're a white-collar worker, 50% of you at minimum need private space. If you're designing a building as an architect or an engineer and you're in an open plan office and everyone's chirping away and, you know, your quality of your work is going to suffer. If you, What do they say? If you get interrupted, it takes 15 minutes just to get back on flow. How efficient is the flow workspace? How often do you get in flow if you're in an open plan office environment? Anyway, that's my rant. I will now stop talking. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know, but, but every all these students today are wearing earbuds no matter where they are. And in our lab, we have lots of common spaces and lots of people have these headphones on. It may be something that you are, as an older folk, are, are thinking is an unacceptable solution, but maybe these people are perfectly happy with them. I'm not sure. I can't, I can't judge. We, it's a word. It, that's add, a good Add that to your survey. Do you wear headbuds because you don't want to be here? Yes or no? <laughs> that, that, <laughs> I think that's a good question. That's actually an excellent suggestion. <laughs> I've done. I'm uh, out. <laughs> you're, you're done. So what? 
what's interesting here is that, you know, Ed, like you, you summarized saying that if you looked at all of the buildings that you've studied with hundreds of thousands of people, there's less than 50% satisfaction. Now, let's take a, a little bit of a journey into the world of thermal comfort research with automobiles because you guys have done some work in that area. What would happen to the automobile industry if they only had 50% satisfaction with their product? Uh, that would get noted by Consumer Reports or somebody, and they would lose a lot of business. Yeah, it, it wouldn't work. And, and, and so the, what they have, of course, is they've provided the, the occupants of cars with some kind of personal control, you know, when they have some kind of control. Yeah, that's uh, a good control. point. They'll, at that point, the people, as long as it provides that control, then the people are happy because they know they can have what they want. And they, they may or may not bother to use it, but at least they know they've got it. And that's very helpful. And, and that's a very useful thing in, in buildings, I, I think, is the, the concept of giving people individual control. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's a really underrated thing. I mean, how difficult is it, I guess, going back to my brand, if you've got your personal office, then it's easier to give someone control over that environment, right? I guess if you're an open plan space, that's a much harder deal to do. Yeah, except, you know, let's say your chair could just envelop you in some way with the, the perfect environment heat you and cool you through your the various parts of your body that you like to be heat and cooled through. And, and that's actually something that we we can measure and it's valuable information. People can feel really good in an environment that otherwise isn't controlled by them. You know, it could be quite a wide range of temperatures that this this magical chair would, would make you comfortable in. Actually, I just had a vision as you said that of, you know, like these complicated $30,000 gamer stations where you've got a guy or girl in a chair and it's at 45 degrees and they've got this big curved screen in front of them and they're in their own little environment, right? That could yeah. be a building designer. You just plop them in the building yeah. in, a, in a warehouse somewhere. Yeah. And, yeah. But this concept of personalized control, I think Johnson Controls, I'm guessing 25, 30 years ago, offered a package, didn't they? If I remember correctly. Yeah, that, was, yeah, we, that was our first big study. And, and they were... There were of this type of technology. There was called a, a task air module, and um, or PEM, I think they call it, personal environmental module. And it, it had you had a little fan, and you had some kind of a no, you had some nozzles in the edge of your desk that blew air on you, and you had a, a radiant panel under the desk, and there was a white noise generator, wow. and an occupancy sensor. And you could dial all these things in your workstation. And so we put 25 of these units in the Bank of America headquarters buildings here in San Francisco and and had another 25 as control that didn't get these things. And, and this is where we found, it was an eye-opener for us, we had 100% satisfied uh, over a long period of time with these 25 people who had the personal control, whereas the other 25 were... were the normal 80%. It was it's such a good building, so it was, it was 80 or 82% or something satisfied. So this is the only case we've ever, almost ever seen in, in a field study where 100% of the people were content with their thermal environment. Uh, that was just that Johnson Controls module. Yeah. But didn't succeed commercially over time. It was very, very expensive initially, and then it became less expensive but still was... Uh, pretty klutzy. You had to cut holes in your desks to get the these ducts to run through it. Yeah. And it had there some things that weren't necessary. It was kind of noisy. We've got much more sophisticated uh, and, and easier and cheaper ways to do it now. Right. Because if we fast forward up to, I think it was 2016 that the Rocky Mountain Institute launched or opened up their new building, which uh, from what I understand is all based on personalized environmental modules or that type of a product. I think Peter Rumsey was involved in that. By the way, we're trying to get Peter on the show. If you have any influence, would you bend his ear for us? <laughs> well, I have equal tr trouble getting through to him. <laughs> <It's public. laughs> Peter, if you're listening, please, please, we'd love to get you on. Not only to talk about that, but just other stuff. But so, yeah, anyways, Ed, so, the, you know, you know, the Rocky Mountain Institute has that new building, has the personalized control stuff. What's the current feedback from that? Have you talked to the folks there? I've not had many contacts with them about it. They did write a paper about it. They, they tested the chairs, which were based on our, our chair design, 
and was being manufactured by Peter Rumsey's company at the right. time. And I, I, I assume they're still using these chairs. I haven't heard from them. They kind of found a lower limit at which people's hands would become cold with the chair. I think it was 67 Fahrenheit. So some kind of hand warmer might be something we want to build in with that, or there are a couple other ways that one might deal with that that issue of of cold hands. But the cold hands, as I read the paper, was only affected 20% of the people, which is the usual discomfort level that we have otherwise. So it was kind of that was the lower limit for the shares to get to the 80% satisfied. Yeah, um, dish. but just for and for our listeners, just so they understand what what happens in that building is that they actually the general overall environment is allowed to drift down to what would otherwise be an uncomfortable environment, but they compensate for that in a microclimate around their desk. Is that a fair way of putting it? So when you're talking about 67 degree air temperatures, sort of where the people's hands, we're actually talking about the general ambient air temperature in the building. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're only heating to 67. And the rule of thumb, you know, in Fahrenheit is for every degree that you can let a building be colder in the winter, you get 5% of your total HVAC saved. You save 5%. In Celsius units, it's 10% for every degree Celsius. Yeah. So they're down there, they're saving you know 20% of their building. And that's true on the warm side too. If you could go up, if, if you normally think that you're going to be uncomfortable above 75, but you let the building go up to 80, you get five degrees increase, that will be 25% saving of your total HVAC over the year uh, just by dealing with the cooling side. By, by letting the building get warmer and using less air conditioning. So, this so both, it works on both sides. Wow. There's a paper published on that by Tyler Hoyt. Um, he's the first author. And it shows a kind of a diagram that looks like a set of cups. And for different climate zones, it differs, obviously. In Miami, you can't save yeah. a lot of energy and heating, but, but in Toronto, you, know, it's, you can yeah. save both and cooling. My, um, my favorite, uh, what, well, this is, again, my personal opinion, and I'm a crazy person, but my favorite solution for open plan space and environments is displacement ventilation with radiant heat and cooling. Has there, have you, has have your team done any research on comfort levels? For that? Yeah, we are, we are working very hard on radiant cooling now. Um, right. Radiant heating is, is kind of well understood from European uh, precedent. They just haven't had to run it to cool buildings as much. And you know, there were all sorts of concerns about, you know, cold ankles or, or yeah. condensate, things like that. And so we're, we're doing a, a lot of work on radiant cooling. It's phenomenally efficient. If, now, now, I'm not talking about these radiant overhead panels. I'm, I'm talking about structural. Yes, so uh, concrete uh, structure. Which we yeah. Tabs, or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Totally integrated, thermally integrated building systems. Those have great potential to, to run efficiently. Of course, what they are not is fast-acting. You know, because you've got a bunch of tubing in the in the concrete, it takes you hours for it to heat up or cool down. But if you use that as a kind of like a base load provider, it gets you to some efficient place, and then you rely on uh, personal systems to tune the person quickly. Yeah. Like in, in the cooling circumstance, a fan you turn it on, you can cool it instantly. And in the heating side, if you had some kind of local radiant heater or or a chair that conductively heats you. Yes. Or a desktop surface that's warmed. You know, you can with uh, 20 watts, you can warm the desktop surface where you're working, and and that you put your arms on it, you you're warmed up really dramatically without uh, much wattage. Actually, that's a great concept. You know, it's a really, I, a heated just, desk. It's a really cool thing. It's a it's a wearable. It's a wristwatch that heats and cools through a cycling. It cycles warm. Or, or cold, if you as you choose it, it's it's done by a small startup in in Massachusetts based on some MIT people, and it's it's remarkably effective. You know, all you're doing is putting like one watt or two watts into a person's wrist, and they feel dramatically warmer or cooler. And you could say, oh, you're fooling them, but that fooling them is fine. You know, because your your body has a lot of you got a lot of energy storage in your body that can you can up your metabolic rate and lower it and automatically in response to the need to stay comfortable or to remain neutral. 
what you want to avoid is is that your fingers and toes get cold in, in the cold yeah. environment. You don't want a hot head in the warm environments. And so if you can kind of take care of those areas at the site, you know, right at the hand or at the foot or at the around the head in the hot uh, environments, then you can let your your own the food you've eaten take care of the other heating and cooling that you might need and you will not feel it you'll feel fine you'll lose weight which is great for most people nowadays so (laughs) one of my this is i think the best way we're going to sell this better kind of building far more environmentally sustainable building technology is based on weight considerations that's interesting Weight loss. I, I think what, one time we should probably, Adam, get uh, a number of these researchers from MIT and Berkeley <sighs> on a call because I get the principles of this wrist device. But I also imagine for me personally, as a my personal observation, that it would become an irritant after some point of time. As a general rule, I don't like to wear jewelry. I generally don't like wearing watches or rings or any that kind of stuff. And then to have to wear a device, I think, just seems it would irritate me after a while. Have they done any studies on that? Yeah, no, we, we had, our studies tend to last about three hours. You know, we get people in for the yeah. half, half day and they work and they, we survey them and we put them through the various drills. So, yeah, we can't really answer that long-term issue. Like, what does it feel like five weeks in? At least not for the wearables. We've done chair studies that lasted for a whole year. And mm-hmm. we know they work well, but... The, the wearables is a very new thing. The wearables is tough because you're impinging on people's personal sovereignty. So say, for example, in Texas, you can just imagine that, right? Hey, I wear this. And, no, mama didn't raise a slave boy. He ain't wearing that thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. uh, there's a sovereignty. But the heated desk is a great idea. So if you've got a big common space, you know, like these co-working spaces where they have these massive desks and people just sit there and work. So if you had a... An ambient that was say at sixty seven F, sixty eight F, yet that mm-hmm. that desk was radiantly heated. It would only have to be at say seventy F, seventy two F to make the difference, right? Yeah. All low exergy systems, yeah. low exergy heating. Yeah. That was that's a great idea. I like that. I might have to steal that from you. Copyright Adam Hamilton <laughs> twenty eight. We've had students <laughs> students build those uh, fifteen years ago already. We're, yeah, we're yeah. pushing along, uh, but, but yeah. there are, it, and I it didn't fly. It, but just see if you can find some manufacturer who'd like to make them. That's really been a, a challenge. And, yeah. and maybe there's some yeah. Canadian manufacturers who might want to pick up the slack there. Uh, but we're try- always trying to encourage that. I, I should say one other thing that's, that's related to all this. I, I'm not fairly optimistic about the, the prospects that we will be able to get our architects and engineers to have better designs in the future. And I think the key is, is feedback. You know, what's, is there feedback in your system? And there was, if there's all sorts of time scales for feedback, you know, like a thermostat yeah. response to what's happening right now and it changes something somewhere else. In a longer t- time frame, we could survey people and, and get feedback about what they think about the building. And ultimately, you know, if buildings are all really bad. Ultimately, maybe the educational system will get feedback and and teach differently, you know, over time frame of decades. So improving the feedback in the building environment is something that's really key. You, you wouldn't have airplanes flying if they didn't have an awful lot of real-time feedback going yeah. on. In the, or also, you know, when they crash, they get they, they get feedback about what went wrong with the building, I mean, with the airplane, because they have extensive examinations. And we have all these kind of low-grade failures that just persist for, for decades which are never investigated, you know, they don't have that feedback. But with new sensing devices, new computer methods, the internet, you know, you can imagine that we should be able to have ways of getting indications of how things are doing, you know, how much energy they're using, how much water, and how happy are the people. And I have a suggestion for it's you, and that is... Comfy, you know, that's really doing I, well, giving people individual control. Yeah, I think so, the center. I think the center for the built environment should manufacture a real-time data terminal device that, that universities could plop into their architectural classrooms 
And on that terminal, they would be able to say today's satisfaction rate in buildings in North America is 50%. (laughs) (laughs) And then every time the students come into class, they can just see exactly what the profession is producing. But the data is there. You have it. It just needs to be broadcast into the industry. And I think if you could do it in the schools, why not start there? Here's a question for you guys as North Americans. When I moved here from the UK, one of the things I noticed was on commercial buildings, there's very, it's not very, it very infrequently do they use outdoor air reset strategies in their control system. So in the UK, for example, you go into a shopping center and it's again, 35 degrees C outside. That building will automatically reset the space temperature up to save energy. Right. So again, 35 degrees C outside, it might be 27, 28 degrees C inside by set point, by design, on the basis mm-hmm. that the thermal shock is sufficient. Now, clearly, this is not tropical climate. This is a uh, you know, temperate climate. But I never see them, those strategies in there. Everyone's in North America, and certainly in Canada, for sure. It's a hard 21 degrees C, plus or minus one, you know, 50% RH. And that's, a, that's an energy yeah. hog, right? Yeah. Why is that? That's- that's one of these absence of feedback things. It's easy yeah. to just set some fixed value and, and it's not necessarily comfortable. Thermal shock, you know, that you mentioned the word a couple yeah. of times here. That's something that doesn't appear in ASHRAE standard 55. And this is the standard for environmental conditioning. Yeah. In fact, no transient condition, transient metabolic rate or transient temperature like that is in the standard except as an upper limit. You know, they say, oh, right. you can't have they're ramping on your space faster than so and so much without getting in trouble or you can't have. So transients is, is also one of the next future thing. So right. it seems to be uh, for transitional spaces, we ought to have some kind of standard. When you walk in out of a hot environment into a building, do you want to cool them really fast by having it really cold in the lobby or do you want to have it at an intermediate temperature and have the coldest temperatures in the building? You know, yeah. we don't even know what's what's the appropriate approach. Yeah. I have a, a I theory about it. That's, but, uh, you know, it's not in the standard at the moment. There's a perception of you know, whenever you walk from a hot space, hot outside to a cool inside, you have that immediate relief, right? The thermal shock is, oh, I'm cool. But the energy penalty for that is just obscene. It's huge, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Adam, you know, we're getting close to the end of the the program. And, you know, Ed, there's just so much more that we could talk about. We're going to have to get you back on. Have you got any words of advice for kids graduating out of high school with an interest in architecture and engineering that you can impart on them? Yeah, no, I I think just to, to keep their eyes open and try to observe the natural world and realize that buildings are artifacts in the natural world inhabited by people who you know, are breathing in them and being comfortable in them. So it's not just a, a visual artifact of some sort or a philosophical expression of some profound thought. You get, you know, <laughs> become more of a rounded person. Uh, so, that, so that when you really get, you know, this is the strong conviction here is that this does not impede creativity. This is not going to get in the way of your being able to come up with a, a good concept to, to know more. And, that's something that's a little hard for students in the beginning or for architectural faculty often to understand. They, they feel that if you spend too much time studying stuff, then, then you won't be able to come up with a new idea. That's not really true. It may be that kind of engineering background that has been offered in engineering schools in the past isn't the right one for architecture students or not all of them. And, and we just have to have a, a quicker and, and more intuitive way of teaching the thermal issues to architecture students. But they have to have that. They do have to learn it one way or the other. They can't just ignore it. Agreed. Um, and that will make for better, better architects and more successful ones. And certainly the people will appreciate what they've done afterwards more if they, if they are more responsible that way. Yeah, you know, That's great advice. Yeah. You know what? That's getting to the why. We spoke about this on a couple of episodes ago. Knowing the why is important, right? Not the how. But you need to know the how, and that's what you're being taught at university. But why is thermal comfort important? Why is energy consumption important? That's what needs to be wrapped into these courses, I believe. 
Yeah, they need that. Yeah. And then they need a little bit of how too. And, yeah. and how is fun. One piece of advice I give them, if they like making things, they should make them. They yes. should get involved in this maker business because that way, hands-on, you can kind of get feedback really fast on on things. And so we, we always had students making kites or smoke machines and things like that, things that could show them where things, what's happening. Yeah. And, there's, and you can get all this cheap componentry now that you can actually design and make your own sensors and things like that, which will give you feedback. And then if you have a bit of that in your background, then it's, it's certainly not going to hurt you going forward. And interesting, I should say that some of the very best architects that we've seen, sometimes they come out of a physics background and out of engineering background. It, you should not, nobody should think that people who come from a rigorous background uh, can't be creative in the in the visual space. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. But, that's I like that. But they're rare. They're, they're not very many of them. Yeah, um, maybe it takes too like long. That. Something is, is that an unfair mm-hmm. advantage if you if you're a sort of engineering, and then you reverse yourself into being an architect? You've almost got a superpower there, right? <laughs> yeah, some of them are, and, and and some of them could do good work. Yeah, yeah. That is- either that. Either that or they'll end up at a psychologist's office. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ed, we, we, need, we need to wrap up. Where can people find you on social media? What's your Twitter handle? What website shall we direct them to? Well, I have a website. I have no Twitter. And, but anyway, the website is CBE, Center for the Built Environment, cbe.berkeley.edu. Okay, we'll put that in the show and notes. That's our- industry consortium and we have all our projects we're trying to keep it up to date things are going quickly and all the publications are all free you can get them from the download place and there's a lot of um software that we've developed that's free that that you can use for determining comfort or mean radiant temperature and things like that that are on that website and some of them are the official asherai software now because they embody the standard Okay, well, we, we'll put that note up there and hopefully you'll get a gazillion downloads. Well, one yeah. or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's you a bunch know, of them. Adam, you know what I think we ought to do here? Because and kudos to CBE and Berkeley for making all of the papers available free. Yes, absolutely. You know, and maybe, and maybe if you're interested, Adam, at some point we maybe want to get two people on to debate open access research. Yes. Those that are behind paywalls and those that offer it for free. I think that would be a great debate. I think Berkeley being one of the large powerhouses in open access information would be great to have you on one side of that debating team. Well, I could get the Berkeley librarian to. to, <laughs> to they, they've been part of that fight. Yeah. The open, which seems to be making progress, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, totally. But it seems to have made some difference with these publishing houses. But yeah. Oh, I think the world is moving towards massive open access, right? But it's a slow movement is my observation. But what do I know? That would yeah. be an interesting there, debate. Yeah, it would be a great debate. There's And one of the other people we get joined on the pro side, and I, I keep forgetting her name, but she's uh, out of the University of Waterloo. Uh, she's an architectural professor there. And we were at a conference, and she said to me, damn it, we're trying to save the world. Share your research. And uh you know, and it's very true. If if we're trying to make a difference, we have to make this information available on a large scale to everybody for free. Otherwise, what good is it? I mean, if you can, if you have to spend forty two dollars to rent it for twenty four hours, or I just saw here recently a, a paper that was well, Candace or out of Australia. I think you know of her. One of their papers was just, and it looks like a really interesting paper. But to rent that article, four hundred and twenty two dollars. Oh, get out of here! That's terrible. Okay. Four hundred twenty-two dollars. Who's going to buy that? Nobody. Yeah. And it's really horrible. You get the article and you realize it's not very good. And you think, ah, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Mass- <laughs> massive buyer's remorse and a hole in your wallet. There's no, no good yeah, right. outcome there, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, there you. So there you go. You heard it here first. We're going to have a debate on open access articles, and uh, we'll have that in a future episode, right, Adam? I agree. We should get a hashtag movement going here. Let's, let's, go. let's get rallying the troops. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, it was a real pleasure. Yes, thank, yeah. thank you very much. That was great. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. This has been fun.
So, Adam, what did you think of that uh, interview? I like Edward, actually. I thought that was a very good interview. I didn't realise how research-based he was, and kudos for the architectural department there, focusing on thermal comfort and the engineering, getting the engineering issues in, right? Yeah. Because that, in my experience, is not normal. How, would you agree or disagree with that? I to- totally agree. Totally agree. I like uh, his um, his path to where he got, you know, where he – Became an art, a frustrated architect. Yeah, you know, and realized that this there's got to be something better. And uh, he said, "Well, if I'm going to make it better, I have to learn about it." And ultimately, found himself as one of the lead researchers in the world on indoor environments. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I'm a frustrated architect. I've just got zero talent, which is why I'm not doing what he's doing. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, it's cause for me, an architect is an artist. A technical artist, right? But ultimately, to me, they're artists. Because for me, a building is an art form. Yes, it has form and structure, right? So great architecture is art, in my opinion. Yeah. Right? And there's a lot of bland architecture, and we can't all live in, you know, star architect buildings. But great architecture is an art form. But there's no denying there is technology there. And I think it's today, in today's environment, being an architect without a deep understanding of the embedded in technologies in your building is a path to bad career outcomes, in my opinion, right? You can't be an architect without getting back to being a technologist as well, I think. That's where it's got to go. Yeah. There's, you know, there's a different risk associated with the architect as an artist and then the the general artist as an artist. So, you know, every time I go to the airport, I drive by this great big oval piece of art that the, you know, the taxpayer, I don't remember what it cost. It was like 1.1 million. Basically what, what they did is they took you know, sheet or steel, and they bent it into a great big circle, painted it blue or purple, whatever it is, put it on the side of the highway, and and said, there you go, Calgary, a million dollars for a piece of art. Now, okay, we can debate the artistic value to that piece, but there's no, you know, no one's going to die from that. No one's going to develop, you know, sick building Ill- illnesses um yeah. you know it's it for some people it might be visually stimulating for other people's it's an eyesore regardless it was a tax burden <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Depending what, the, the, doesn't matter how you like it or not it's still a burden on the tax system that was probably unnecessary but when we talk about art in buildings there's a different risk associated with it and so you know the guy that welded that big steel circle no one's gonna die but the art the architect that designs that building, like Ed said, these are real, live, breathing people inside those buildings. And so it's not enough to have the artistic side of it. You also have to understand the human factor behind it. I agree. I mean, architecture, there's a duty of care architects have to society and to people and who live in their buildings and work in their buildings, right? And that duty of care, I think, has... In the last 20 years, there's been a move to specialisms because of complexity and technology. Fair enough, right? Right. But that has sort of – a consequence of that, I think, has been architects have become more pure artists. And then they've leaving the technology, abdicating the the technologist role a bit, right? And I think that technology role has to come back a little bit, in my opinion. They don't need to be deep specialists, but they need to be applied technologists. You know what I mean? Right. And, you know, that's not easy. I'm not saying any of this is easy. There's a reason it takes four years and eight and another four years to become qualified in engineering technology and architecture because it's tough, right? If everyone yeah. could do it, everyone would be doing it. It's not right. meant to be easy, right? And this is how you sort the good from the bad out. But, you know, I think we have to move back to the architect being a technologist as well as an artist. You know, there was an old joke in, when I was a property developer in the UK. I used to get this old joke. Uh, there's two types of architect, right? There's a con- conceptual architect. They're the best guys. They're the star architects. They do do a couple of lovely drawings and they go, build that. I'll see you in three years and I'll cut the ribbon <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'll take the glory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And that's a caricature. And it's funny because it's half true, right? Yeah. And there's always going to be a room for the craziest architect. But really, the mainstream needs to move to architect architects as technologists as well, in my opinion. Yeah. And again, well, yeah. And- and, and use the term architecture through profound thought. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I can just picture these guys, you know, lie, maybe they're out, uh, you know, being inspired by nature or whatever, right? And so they've got this, <laughs> I, 
profound thought. And all of a sudden that turns into a building and my God, we've seen buildings that, oh, you know, they shouldn't exist. And then when they do exist, I mean, then we yeah. can name this, the star architects that cause these creations yeah. to, they leak, they're energy hogs. They're totally thermally uncomfortable. The lighting is horrendous. The sound is just, you know, a total annoyance. Yes. But it was a manifestation of their profound thought. And that was, and that became the important thing. Forget the building, forget the people inside. It was, you know, and that's wrong. That has to change. And yeah. It's like, I walk lonely as a cloud through the fields. I am inspired. <laughs> and then four years later, I win a, the Sterling Architecture Prize. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, it's, architects. I'm not beating on you. I think you're super important. And I love, I would love to be an architect if I had even a smidgen of talent, but you know, it's art yeah. and I love it. Yeah. I, yeah, my, I have a niece that uh, just graduated or, or going through school right now in architecture and uh, you know, they, it is a tough job, but when I look at her career and she actually started at SAIT and took the architectural technology program first right. before going down into uh, New York to take one of the, uh, enroll one of the schools down there and in talking, you know, with them and my uh, brother and uh, sister-in-law, how important that technology program was for her success in the architectural program at a university level. Yeah. That And that's huge. And I think that's one of the things that we have in Canada that doesn't necessarily exist in other parts of the world is that technology offering. So we have lots of technology colleges across Canada. You can get an, an engineering technician diploma. Yeah. You can get an architectural technician diploma. And those are usually two-year programs, but they don't – those programs are really fundamental-based. They're practical education programs. And I know – and I went through one of those through the uh, Building Construction Engineering Technology Program. When I got out, I had far more skills than most engineering grad students. Yeah. Now, ultimately, the university student is taught to think at a much higher level with a much higher application of science that no, there's no doubt about it. It takes a certain brain to graduate from a university engineering program, but ultimately the practical skills, they seem to work out. The, the technologist has the opportunity to operate at the same level as the engineer in terms of the science application of science. And I think a lot of the engineers appreciate the tech, what the technicians bring to the design team. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, again, over over the last 20, 25 years, there's been this drift, this class system of I'm an engineer, you're a technologist. And there is, I'm talking about engineers here, I think engineers see a big gap between them and technologists, and I see a very small gap between them and technologists. Yeah. And, uh, you know, things have just got to come together, right? We, we've broken out into these deep silos of expertise, and these silos have to overlap in the future. Right, we have to get over ourselves, and you know, see the value. This is where lead. I, I'm not a fan of lead, but this is where leader onto something. This integrated design process. Right, Everyone talks about it. Very few people do it. Right, I've done seventy yeah. lead projects. Only two of them have used that process properly. But you know, those gaps between people are not as big as people think. Like to think they are. Right. Yeah. You know, and I don't know. It. I think I want to give architects some love here because I do beat down on them a lot. I would love to be an architect because it is, they're so important. The built environment is so important. We all spend 80% of our time in buildings nowadays, right? Yeah. In the West, hey, so. By the way, by the way, you have the persona for an architect. Like you look like an architect. You might, have, you, might have, <laughs> <laughs> you might have, you might have, you might have, you know? Yeah. So anyways, I mean, to throw on a, throw on a cardigan yeah. and, uh, I've got a cardigan. Have, I'd have, uh, some <laughs> leather patches on my elbows. Yeah, 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 and I have a really thick set of round rimmed glasses. You got, you got it. You, and I would just yeah. walk around with a pad, and I'd have an entourage, and I yeah. would do sketches, and I'd pass yeah. them off to someone and say, "Draw that." <laughs> you got it. You, yeah. you got it going. You got it going, Adam. So yeah, yeah I can see. You. I can see you being an architect. And you know, architects have the ability to be immortal, right? So Christopher Wren is immortal, right? Richard Rogers, Sir Norman Foster will be immortal. Because their yeah. buildings will stand long after they're gone, right? There's an immortality to that. That's where the gold complex comes from, I guess, for architects, right? There's yeah, some of that going on. So, yeah, you know, sure. arch architects matter. They matter to society. They matter to everyone. And the buildings they build are important, but they are also forms of art. 
if you're an architect, you have the ability to leave your stamp on society and become immortal. That's not shabby <laughs> if you can pull it off, right? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there's two professions that get God complexes. One is the doctors, the physicians, yeah. right? Yeah. And the other one is the architect. And when you think about it, and again, you know, to kudos to those that choose the architectural profession, if you become uh, well-known and you do good buildings, and hopefully from this podcast, you'll be one of our students, Yeah, <laughs> uh, that you'll be immortalized through your through your design that is not only beautiful, but also very functional. The physician, they can solve all kinds of people, but those people go out and they die. Yeah. <laughs> so no matter how much God complex a doctor has, ultimately his patient dies, where the yeah. building lives a long, long time, or could live a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's a good point yeah. to uh, to stop there. Think about that, boys. Immortality. Yeah. It's in your grasp <laughs> while you're while you're tooling away in your CAD CAD machine in that architect's That's, office. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> good one. I'll see you on the next one. <laughs> All right, Adam. Always a pleasure, man. Take care. Cheers. Bye. You've been listening to the Edifice Complex Podcast with Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean. To access show notes for this episode, visit edificecomplexpodcast.com. Also, if you would like Robert or Adam to speak, teach, or consult on your project or business, please email admin at edificecomplexpodcast.com. See you next time.